my name is Christoph Petich, and I would like to present you the usage of the component model in software-defined vehicles. And uh, half of that presentation is actually about native components. So I will first uh, present to you how WebAssembly and the software-defined vehicle work quite well together. I will introduce you to the component model and give you a quite in-depth um, look into canonical lifting and lowering works. Um, then I will just switch thematically to something non-WebAssembly, which is a native binaries. And I will just tell you um, how we can optimize the lifting and lowering towards a shared everything um, setup, which is exactly what native binaries enable. And this is a thing I would call symmetric ABI. And then I will just give a quick outlook about topics which I did, will not cover within this talk. So, um, just a statement at the beginning. WebAssembly helps software-defined vehicle quite a lot. So let's see. Um, this is a typical hardware architecture for software-defined vehicles. This is quite modern um, because it has two central vehicle computers, the red ones, uh, which are typically PC-like architectures. Um, then uh, roughly uh, one half to the edge of the car, there is these green ones. These are zone controllers. And these are typically either um, using Oryx a microcontroller or an ARM Cortex-M microcontroller. Uh, and there's two to four of these. And then there's many sensors at the edge of the car or at the windscreen or whatever. And these sensors are very versatile. So they um, have a lot of different CPU architectures. And so as you can guess, um, this is quite a challenge to write software in a portable way for all these different um, architectures, even though this is already the streamlined version. So um, older cars have much more versatile um, things in there. So let's just uh, go for the classical containers, uh, which are typically used with um, uh, software-defined vehicles. And these classical containers are architecture and operating system specific. And the sad thing is they only work on two out of the many um, controller units in the car, mainly the central vehicle computer. So we can only place our software, which we developed, onto two out of these many controllers. And also, uh, we have to take care of using the right operating system and the right architect CPU architecture. So for WebAssembly components, on the other hand, um, these components fit everywhere. They are quite lightweight, and they're also capable of running on a microcontroller. And there is plenty of microcontrollers in the car. So now you can see we place a lot of them on the central vehicle computer, a few of them on the edge con um, controllers, and then um, each sensor basically gets its own um, program to run on there. WebAssembly also enables untru running untrusted third-party code quite well and without uh, endangering the overall car architecture. So it fits quite nicely to the software-defined architecture. You can move some programs which you really need um, a power down. For example, intrusion detection systems. Um, if you power down your car, if you turn off the engine, you really would like to have the central vehicle computer turned off because it draws a lot of power. And so you move your, um, you either phase out your programs or you move them to the edge where, there's, where these um, more efficient low power devices are located. And of course you turn up um, or down some of the sensors. You can also do a similar thing, one once uh, one of these uh, controllers actually start failing. So if you figure out something is broken and your um, software architecture is capable of doing that, you could just migrate that software to a still working um, controller. And of course, assuming that you can um, prioritize with the remaining software um, capabilities. You can also run these components on the edge without recompilation. This is also um, uh, similar to deploying things in shadow mode or red-blue development where you just take a copy of an already existing um, software 
put it also in the car, and then just run them side by side and compare the results of these. And this is um, really facilitated by just uh, using the component model and the well-defined um, input and output param um, types which are used there. You can also just move everything to the cloud, and that, of course, is um, what is typically called the digital twin. So let's take a closer look at the component model. Here we have uh, an application of a publisher subscriber um, example of um, Autozar. Autozar is automotive open system architecture. And um, you can see uh, it's three components. These share some interfaces, these are linked together. Um, and it's a lot of Autozar um, uh, interfaces there. There is some uh, interfaces regarding threading, because this is a C++ program. We cannot run without multiple threads. And we also have some WebAssembly standard interfaces, the VASI IO poll, for example, which also gives an indication that this is a VASI 0.2 program. So, and we can run this um, components in the car, or we can just place them in the browser and add a bit of um, Um, so here, for example, we have an assortment of um, HTML interfaces, um, elements which we can use to just call, for example, a just call, um, method on the radar. So it's a virtual radar. It's just uh, giving out um, uh, uh, random data. So it's just for, to the, um, display the capabilities of the publisher subscriber. It's not a real um, uh, real-world system. We can see the application output on the top left, and we can, of course, do all the things we really like to do um, when we are debugging programs in there. We can just put breakpoints into the source code. We can single step, in, um, inspect local variables, and inspect the call stack. So this one is very interesting because it already combined, uh, combines two languages. It has the C++ source code at the bottom, and all the rest is written in JavaScript. So this already uses a um, uh, component model to combine two languages. So um, these are the exact things the component model gives. Um, it's a language neutral interface definition, which is the WebAssembly interface types. And these high level data types, option, result, string, vector, future, and stream. So there's already 0.3 in there. These data types match quite well with the Autozar adaptive platform data types. So it's a good match. And this is also why we really prefer this um, WebAssembly-based um, types for an interface definition over classical things. We tried using um, C interface between Rust and C++, and that, of course, was a lot of effort and difficult to get right. And with WebAssembly interface technology, it really gets quite easy, especially when it comes to ownership, passing of um, values between C++ and C and, uh, and Rust or any other language. And the calling convention is standardized. So uh, the canonical ABI uh, is being used. So you have really have a binary interface between these components. And the system calls are also standardized. So you can also create um, operating system independent um, the, uh, modules. So I will now give a closer view into how exactly the canonical ABI works by just uh, showing an example of lifting and lowering. So um, if we just take this start, um, it's a, uh, we define a function. It's called my function. And this function takes a string as an argument and returns a string as an, a result. And on the left side, we have the caller, which is a component which just calls into the runtime. And the implementation is in the right component, which is the implementing caller uh, um, component or the callee. The caller, the application, calls into the binding, which is auto-generated from the bit. Then it crosses the runtime. Then it will just cross the binding on the right side and call into the implementation. So let's take a closer look at how this string travels between these components. 
The application starts with a string in memory. We just assume that it's located at address 42. And exactly this information is passed to the binding. So this string slice of the my function definition, which is the, the Rust interface between the application and the um, binding, which is generated, uh, just receives the address and the length of the string, so 42 and 5 characters. Um, then the binding will prepare an area where the resu um, result will reside. So this is the return area. And then passes these three bits of information to the runtime. So it calls the my function function of the runtime, which is imported from the runtime, uh, and passes the first uh, the address of the string, the length of the string, and the address of the return area, where the return string will be stored. So now the runtime makes a call into the callee, into the implementation. It cannot directly pass the string because uh, caller and callee do not share memory. So the, both of these are sandboxed, so we have to make a copy of the string within the callee uh, address space. So we first allocate. For this, we just call the CABI reallocation function, which is uh, doing all the allocation. Um, and the first two arguments are not of importance. It's basically a null pointer, so there's no existing memory um, buffer to extend. We just want a new one with a length of five characters and an alignment of one, which basically means we don't care about alignment. So our callee will allocate the memory. So now five bytes somewhere within the memory are allocated, and it's uh, exactly at address 68. And this is what the binding returns to the runtime. So now the runtime knows about the source address and the destination address. Both are within different memory areas. So it would copy the string from the caller, from the memory space of the caller, into the memory space of the callee. Then it knows which address to pass to the my function. And so it will call into the binding with the address and the length. And the binding will just forward this information to the function itself. So now we are just arrived halfway to the implementation. We can now see that the string is passed by ownership, so by value. So the application now receives ownership of the string. So it can free it, it can hold it. Now the, um, um, the string at address 68 is in the ownership of the application on the right side. So. Um, the application just returns another string. We just return wasmcon, so we just allocate a memory. Uh, at this, in this case, it's actually at the address 210, and pass the address and the length back to the binding. The binding um, can only return a single value, which is a limitation of the current implementation of the component model or of um, WebAssembly. And so we have to store these two values at a known memory location and just return the address of that memory location. And so this one now returns uh, 230. And so with um, the runtime, just reads the two, two bits of information from the address 230, which is uh, the location and the length of the string, remembers it. Now we need to allocate within the caller because it's another memory again, and we need to um, copy it over. So we now allocate seven bytes on the left side. We just receive a new buffer, which is at location 440. And now we can just do the copying. So seven characters from the SS210 of the, on the right side to the address 440 on the left side. And now, basically, the uh, um, string arrived in the caller's memory. We can now set up the return area where it's exactly uh, noting the address and the length. And then we can clean up on the right side. For that one, we just call a post function um, on the my function. And this one just receives the same 
argument which was previously returned from the my function call. And so it knows to freeze a string at 210. And it knows to just get rid of the return area because it's no longer used. So now on the right side, everything is clean. The string, hello string, the argument is still in the ownership of the application. And the runtime can return to the caller. So um, the binding has already all the information in there. There's no return value for that call. So it just reads out from the return area uh, and passes the string with the length back to the application in the string object. So now, both applications own their strings and the call has finally passed. Just doing a quick recap. Caller and callee, there's plenty of functions with different calling directions. So basically, between the app and the binding, it's always quite easy. Uh, but between the binding and the runtime, there is more functions which get called. And it's um, typically allocation and freeing function and the invocation of the, fun of the function itself. So with all this in mind, we now to actually want to go for a different place. We want to compile this to native. We don't want to um, use WebAssembly any longer because WebAssembly has a small penalty in inefficiency and we just want to go for the maximum efficiency just to save cost on the controllers in the car. So we just trade the sandboxing for higher speed or higher efficient energy efficiency. Um, native binaries provide the maximum CPU efficiency because the compiler can really target towards it with maximum um, amount of information. And of course, the unchanged debugging and deployment experience for the um, um, programmers is also quite interesting. It enables us to mix languages with minimal overhead and we will just see that there is some optimization we can do when we modify the binary interface. And we can always transition to and from WebAssembly by just recompiling to native or WebAssembly as a compilation target. So if we just take the same setup and not change anything uh, and compile it to native, we have an executable on the left side, which is doing the call, which contains the main function. It links to a shared library, which um, is just replacing the um, runtime, which will do all the logic between the two components. Um, and on the right side, we have the implementation shared library. So it's two shared libraries. It's a bit complex. It looks a bit unclean, so there was an interesting question on whether we get, can get rid of the mesh. Let's see. Um, the component model enables mixing languages, so um, we are looking for a way of just using the C++ application with a stack written in Rust. So stack is basically the run runtime environment. Um, the AutoZar adaptive application is fully defined in C++ only. And so this um, API is fully defined by this um, standards body. Um, we need a small adapter, and then we go for language neutral. And now we can exchange both the upper part and the lower part for any language we would like. And in this case, we just exchange the lower part for a Rust stack. This uses asynchronous methods and events um, using VASI 0.2, so it's full of polybols, and it's a native binary. And when I run this one, I get a nice output of that application. It's similar to the one which I showed running in the browser. But we have four di or five different binaries which are used here. So the um, middle ones, are the ones um, written in C++. This is the application code. And each of these applications outputs a main function that, of course, maps to the run function of VASI. And so we have a main function which will just call, uh, which will just create a new thread, then call the main function of the publisher, and then just call the main function of the subscriber. 
And these two need some infrastructure to talk to each other, basically the um, operating system um, equivalent of the VASI clocks and poll, so waiting on events and uh, setting a timeout and similar things, and the stack itself, which is uh, the logic for doing the logging, execution management, uh, uh, healthkeeping, and all these things. So this is real, this is the output, and this would not have been possible using this more complex setup, but for that one we just used a simplified API, an ABI, which I will just present after taking a closer look at the symbols. So it's uh, still uh, some imported symbols. The four, um, four at the top are the imported, and this one is uh, basically the symbol which matches to a resource. So we have a constructor, we have a destructor, and there is a method in between. And at the bottom, we have an adjust function which returns a future. And because it's VASI 0.2, we don't have native future types. We just have to um, mimic futures by just some um, resource object which acts like a future, which means we can subscribe to it and get a pullable, which we can wait on, and then we can just get the value. Um, sadly, these symbols um, do not map well to native, so we just need to escape the slash, colon, and uh, brackets, which are part of the normal symbol um, things. So let's take a closer look at the symmetric ABI, which is an optimization of this call, because we know caller and callee share the same memory space, so they have a common memory. This is shared everything, so we still have the same um, interface between the application and the binding, and the implementation and the binding. And let's see whether we can get rid of all the functions besides the one doing the call. And maybe we can also get rid of the mesh or runtime. So we just allocate the string, we allocate the return area, we just pass all of these as arguments to the callee directly. So now we make a direct call, there's no runtime in between. And there, the binding just takes these values, makes a copy, because um, the function expects a string as an, um, a call by value. And then just passes this new LE allocated string on to the application. So to the application, there's no difference. This one just returns a string. We can now, um, we know from the call uh, from the um, call information that 420 was the address of the return area so we can just store the information here so the 210 the address and the length into the return area there's not a lot of bookkeeping involved but um, conceptually we are just passing ownership of the string from the right um, component to the left component and when the function returns, it just uh, the binding just reads out the information from the return area and passes the string back to the application. So to the application, there's no difference. It just works fully unchanged. And the interesting part is also this is an unchanged import ABI. So we just take the ABI as it's defined on the left side and now just use it also between these two components, and they map quite well. If we want to go a bit further, we can also um, make the calling convention between the application and the binding symmetric between downwards and upwards. So if we just pass a string slice from the binding to the app whenever we call into the application, this is of course an API change, so it has to change the source code. Then we can get rid of the copy on the right side, and we can now see this is basically the minimum of copying which we need, so it's extremely efficient. But if we just exchange the linking between the executable and the shared object for a different shared object or for a different ex um, executable, we can 
um, add full insulation without changing or recompiling the, either the callee or the caller. So we just use a new connection.so, which mimics the callee.so and provides all the functions. And we just use an executable on the right side, which um, invokes the callee whenever the caller just signifies so over some form of communication, mostly Ethernet, interprocess communication, something like that. So we can still use full insulation by using this API just as a runtime option. And we can still embed um, WebAssembly components into it. So now on the right, I just took an um, unmodified WebAssembly component. So with the canonical ABI, I add a small bridge between the symmetric ABI and the canonical ABI, and which also just contains the interpreter invocation. So the, the ways of running the WebAssembly, interpreting it, or we just use wasm 2 c as seen yesterday in Dominic's um, presentation. And so adding WebAssembly for full insulation is just a runtime option we can put at any, at any point in time. So just uh, going for some wider things. So um, using WebAssembly interface types without WebAssembly enables some unique things. You can use zero overhead plugins, for example, for doing plugins within web wasm time or an embedded, by just creating um, shared libraries for these. And you can create a stable interface between Rust modules, which would work across compiler versions. Rust is uh, notoriously known for not having a binary compatibility between compiler versions. And um, since both sides don't have a sandbox, the plugins can use all of POSIX, which is both a good and a bad thing. So if you don't trust the plugin, it's bad. But if you trust the plugin and the plugin wants to do all the network lifting or just interfacing with hardware, then it's quite neat because you basically do not have to um, write your, um, your implementations on the host side. So it gets more easy. So these are the things which would clearly be beyond the 35 minutes possible for this talk. So if you want to really use C++, you need multi-threading and exceptions. Yeah, uh, when I deployed this for the first time around one year ago, it was really a bad experience and I had to add a lot of things there. Um, we also designed a symmetric resource ABI, as you can guess from the example I just showed, which uh, already uses um, resources a lot of um, at the time, for, especially for the futures and streams. Um, this is also just taking the unmodified import ABI. I have um, a working prototype of asynchronous calls um, using this native one, and this one is also just using the um, imported ABI. So um, it's just using the one with uh, three argument, uh, three pointer arguments and returning a, a value between zero and four, uh, three. And this worked well. It's three, uh, two um, weeks old. For functional safety, we would need to do some zero allocation because allocation is notoriously unreliable when it comes to timing. And if we want to do um, ADAS, so um, advanced driver assistance systems like cameras or radars, uh, we really want to move a lot of data between these components. So we would actually need a zero copy sandboxed environment using shared memory. There's some prototypes for all of this. Here you can find some more information. So um, I do have a fork of Wasm tools and WebBindgen at uh, this GitHub repository. There's an issue for the symmetric ABI, uh, which was not that active in the past days. Um, and there is a prototype of flat data types, which, which we would need for shared memory. So just to summarize very quickly, um, symmetric ABI optimizes the component model for the shared everything case, and it's fully source code compatible. And mixing sandbox and shared everything is still possible and leverages the complementary strengths. 